digestive system goes between being horribly constipated to not being able to get out of the bathroom. A lot of pain in the stomach, bloating, constipation. Indy's on the floor, you know, on all fours, just crying and screaming out. I was getting constipated. I, whatever I ate would not actually digest properly. I get intense, intense bowel pain with the periods if I'm eating wrong. The whole bloating system, it has just gone oh, out of control. No one has explained about um, digestion or, no, nothing. I have no disclosures, but I'd like to acknowledge the College of Surgeons and also the Notara Scholarship, as you've heard about, for other research I'm currently undertaking, although unrelated to endometriosis. There will be some degree of overlap, but I'm hoping that it will also help fill in the gaps. And if there is overlap, hopefully that means there is, there is that point is very important. So endometriosis, as you know, is the presence of endometrial tissue beyond the endometrial cavity. It is often within the pelvis, but does not have to be limited to the pelvis. And I've had patients who actually have sort of um, deposits of endometriosis within the belly button. And uh, it is clearly an estrogen dependent condition, and therefore it is uh, commonly a condition that affects women of reproductive age. And what happens, as we've heard as well from previous speakers, is that it bleeds internally monthly. And that blood, which is sitting within the peritoneum, uh, within the pelvis, causes irritation and therefore inflammation, pain, and therefore scarring. And the inflammation and the scarring then causes ongoing problems in terms of fertility and chronic pelvic pain, as we've heard about. And depending on where the site of inflammation is and where the scarring is, so whether it's on the bladder or whether it's on the ureters, whether it's on the nerves or the bowel, it then explains some of the symptoms that patients may also experience as we'll go through shortly. As we've also heard about, the incidence is very difficult to determine, but we think it is between five and 12% of all females. And most patients are symptomatic between the age of, uh, highly symptomatic between the age of 25 and 35. So what actually causes endometriosis? Now, we don't actually really understand, but the favorite theory is this theory of um, retrograde and, uh, menstruation, where blood is meant to go down south, but unfortunately, because of contraction or spasm within the uterus, blood doesn't go down south, and it then allows it to reflux back into via the fallopian tubes into the pelvis itself. And that tissue is viable. It can then implant all around the pelvis, on the peritoneum, on the bladder, on the ureters, on the bowel, as I said, causing all those symptoms. There are other possible mechanisms as summarized in this table, but I just want to draw your attention to the last one here, which sort of suggests that maybe endometriomas might have a slightly different origin. But the, whatever the mechanism is, what it then causes in my mind from a surgical sort of point of view is that there are three possible ways of, um, of appearances of endometriosis when we operate on these patients. The first one is the superficial type deposits that we've seen quite a few of them so far. I'll show you some slides, some photos later on. They're just kind of little spots just on the surface of the peritoneum. And then the second type of, um, of um, disease is kind of like the chocolate cysts or the endometriomas within the ovaries itself. And finally, you've got the really deep ones that actually cause really deep scarring. It sort of goes straight into bowel or um, other adjacent organs. And unfortunately, as we've also heard, even though I kind of classify them into the three different types of appearances, they don't necessarily correlate with symptoms, but it does matter in terms of what we actually do as um, gynecologists or, or as surgeons or gynecologists. Some pictures, the one up here, as you can see, small superficial deposits just on the lining of the bowel. Um, this is the, the scarring. Uh, that's what we call adhesions. As you can see here, a bit of bowel is caught up onto the back of the uterus where it's meant to be free. And you can imagine that that could cause symptoms. And we'll talk about that shortly. This is the appearances of a chocolate cyst. Once you've actually opened the cyst, whatever inside is all old blood, therefore termed chocolate cyst. And that's the sort of the deeply infiltrating type with very deep scars. As you can see, it's pulling everything inwards and therefore drawing all the different organs together, making everything scarred and sort of stuck together. So what are the risk factors for endometriosis? Um, we think that one of the major risk factors now is that obviously with better nutrition, girls are having their periods a bit earlier. 
you're not having babies that early and therefore you're having lots of cycles of periods before you actually get that sort of break from period because of pregnancy. And because of that repeated stimulation, you then get all this endometrial deposits, which may not be that symptomatic if you, say, had a baby, but then because you've got lots of cycles, it then promotes growth and ongoing problems. And there is certain an element of, um, of um, genetic hered hered hereditability in this condition. About 50% of patients, particularly the ones with a deeply infiltrative type, do have a family history. Um, and there's actually been some work that's looked at the genetic um, factors of it, and there has been some genes that's been identified. But it's not entirely clear at this point in time why is it that some patients have the same genes, but they don't necessarily manifest the disease, but some do. And once again, the problem is that symptoms, symptoms do not necessarily correlate with the presence of um, genes and so on and so forth. Now, symptoms. So what are the symptoms that most patients have? I think, as we heard from this first speaker, pain is a really big problem. 80% of patients have pain. And most of this manifests in terms of dysmenorrhea, which is the painful periods. But up to 30% of patients can have painful pain with intercourse, but a variety of different pains as well, pelvic pain, back pain, and a lot of it we don't fully understand, but it might be related to all these pelvic nerves that sit under the lining of the, of the pelvis, under the peritoneum. And the pain can radiate down into the thigh simply because there's a nerve called the obturator nerve, which goes down into the legs. And it gives you that sort of jelly, wobbly leg type feeling when you get that sort of shooting pain down the leg. Gynecological symptoms, we've heard about that. And obviously, uh, hopefully we'll focus a little bit more about this, about your bowel symptoms. Bowel symptoms can vary, and it's interesting how the same disease, same appearances, can affect one person very differently from the next person. One person will constipate, the next person would have diarrhea, and the next person could have fluctuating diarrhea and constipation. Bloating is a very, very common symptom, and uh, as you'll hear shortly as well, is that unfortunately a lot of the symptoms actually overlap with symptoms of irritable bowel syndrome. And that's why there is a lot of delay in diagnosis and possibly misdiagnosis as irritable bowel syndrome when patients actually do have endometriosis. And uh, rectal bleeding, this tends to only affect patients where the endometriosis has actually infiltrated through the muscle of the bowel, in th through the lining of the bowel, so much so that you actually bleed through the bowel as well with your periods. Nausea and vomiting, very common as well. And these are some of the other, the urinary symptoms and fertility issues are also very common as we'll hear about later on in the day. Now the purpose of this slide is just to show you um, how the deposits, where the deposits could be. So this is just a very, this, these two are very schematic um, diagrams. So deposits can be anywhere, it can be on the uterus, can be in the ovary causing the endometriosis or the chocolate cyst. It can be on this ligament here, the uterus sacral ligaments, that's where the nerves run. And you can imagine that if that became scarred down, and that's right at the top of the cervix with intercourse, if that moves, that can cause a lot of pain. And this deposits here on the bowel, again, they cause scarring, narrowing, and that irritates the bowel so much so that every time you have menstrual cycle, that inflammation irritates the rectum. You feel the urgency to go to the toilet. You get diarrhea. You might get bleeding through and through if you have uh, endometriosis that's eroded through and through the bowel, layers of the bowel. Now, symptoms. Now, up to 30% of patients are, in fact, asymptomatic from the endometriosis, and that's kind of interesting. And, you, as, and the one, that's one of the things that actually contributes to the, con the confusion as to why some patients can have such severe symptoms and yet other patients could have very severe disease and yet have no symptoms. Pain, as uh, Susan has spoken about, so I don't really want to go into too much, but um, a lot of that could be related to too much prostaglandin secretion, causing the uterus to cramp down, and there, because it's cramping down, there's not enough blood getting to the uterus, causing pain. One of the things that she alluded to as well is um, uh, nerve involvement. There are lots of nerves within the pelvis as part of the pelvic plexus. They're responsible for bowel function, for bladder function. And when you have direct nerve involvement, you can get obviously direct pain as a result of nerve infiltration. But beyond that, there are other mechanisms because of inflammation. And with chronic pain, what happens is that, you know, pain is a, is a mechanism to try and tell us to protect ourselves. If you put your hand on something that's hot, you're going to get pain and you'll move your hand away. But what happens is that you can't really 
if you don't do very much about this pain, it then the pain increases to try and tell you to do something about this pain. And that upregulates your perception of pain. So even if the stimulus remains the same, your pain becomes more and more and more severe. And as Susan also talked about, the use of narcotics of things like morphine or endone, and while it provides short-term relief, it also contributes to that upregulation of your pain threshold, requiring more and more painkillers. And what happens with chronic pain is that it causes a lot of other problems, it causes anxiety, depression, not to mention some of the other social problems that we've also heard about. And in the ideal world, it would be so easy for us as surgeons, if you could see something, and if we could burn that or get rid of that, that would get rid of the disease. But unfortunately, it doesn't. The severity of symptoms does not always correspond to the severity of disease. The site of the symptom also does not always correspond with the site of the disease, which makes it very difficult for us sometimes to diagnose this or to know what to exactly do. And which is why it's also very important for patients to take their endometriosis into their, into their hands kind of, and be proactive in sort of lifestyle measures like exercise or um, dietary type, type uh, management. In deeply infiltrative endometriosis though, the symptoms tend to correlate a little bit better. Um, in that, for example, if you get pain with intercourse, you tend to have a slightly more predictable, predictable pattern of disease. Now, this is just summarising what I've just spoken about uh, in a research study. So, in the, the right-hand bar in different age group, you can see that the symptoms that patients might complain of might be suggestive of endometriosis. But when you actually come to um, do a laparoscopy, you'll find that not that many of them might have endometriosis. And by the time you do a biopsy, you then find that there's even less. What this suggests is that there is a lot of overlap between symptoms of endometriosis and other possible diseases. Misdiagnosis, not uncommon. Delayed diagnosis, not uncommon either. As we've heard from other speakers, on average, about 6 to 12 years to the time of diagnosis. This obviously results in unnecessary suffering. And what is the reason for this? Is it because the doctors are incompetent? Not necessarily, I hope so. Uh, that's what I hope anyway. But there is actually a lot of overlapping symptoms, particularly in my area with the, regards to bowels. I deal with a lot of patients with constipation. A lot of them do not have endometriosis. I have a lot of patients with diarrhea. And again, a lot of them do not have endometriosis. And it makes it more difficult because there is a lack of correlation between symptoms and disease sometimes, and there is a lot of overlap. And this is also possibly the reason why sometimes patients' symptoms don't go away completely after we've treated them. Diagnosis, how do we actually diagnose patients? Obviously, ideally, in the ideal world, if we can get everyone sort of confirmed with endometriosis and with a biopsy, that would be perfect. But unfortunately, that means an operation. And we don't want to perform unnecessary operation on patients because operations have risk. So therefore, surgery should ideally only be performed when it is necessary because the symptoms are severe enough to justify it. And at the same time, ideally, a therapeutic type thing, not just a diagnostic procedure, but some sort of therapy could be performed, ablating the endometriosis or cutting away the chocolate cyst, could be performed to reduce symptoms. So, and in the ideal world, again, if there was a single blood test that we could have that would say, yep, you have endometriosis, perfect. There was a question mark as to whether or not one might be becoming available soon, but I think watch this space. The, how easy it is to diagnose endometriosis depends on the type of disease. I mean, obviously, as Susan talked about before as well, you can't actually feel those tiny little spots. They are millimetres and they're very flat. You can't feel them. It also depends on what side of disease you're talking about. If you've got the deep scar, sort of rectal vaginal septum or within the back wall of the vagina at the top of the cervix, that you can feel, but apart from that, you may not be able to feel. Tests, so your doctors might end up, because it's difficult to diagnose sometimes, you, your doctor might end up doing a lot of different tests for two purposes. One is to confirm the diagnosis, and the other one is to rule out other possible diagnoses, simply because there are a lot of overlapping symptoms. What tests might he or she order an ultrasound? What you might see is endometriomas, or those chocolate cysts on the ovaries. There is a special ultrasound probe that sort of does the slight test, and what this does is this is very good for the rectal vaginal um, type endometriosis, where the, where the vagina and the, and the rectum is kind of stuck together because of the scarring. And what that does is that if they can't slide over each other, then that suggests that the two of them are stuck together. 
that's a special type of ultrasound. A um, colonoscopy might be required to make sure that there is no other causes for the rectal bleeding. And I have to say, in my practice so far, I, I really have not seen that many patients with endometriosis that's actually gone through and through to actually cause any, to actually allow us to identify anything on colonoscopy. But obviously, prior to an operation, it is important to make sure that there's nothing else there. MRIs are very accurate, but the problem with them is that it, it can be quite a long test. You're having to lie flat on a table for 40 minutes, 50 minutes sometimes. It is costly, and my understanding is that it's not rebatable. Contrast enemas, hardly used these days. Laparoscopy, by far the best, but I come back to the earlier slide. You only do it if you have to do it because of severity of symptoms and if you can offer something at the same time to reduce symptoms. It is both a test as well as um, a sort of therapeutic modality. So this is what we see at the time of laparoscopy. This is one view. This is the second view. Just to give you an idea, we look at things on the outside, not the inside. And um, this is what we, things look like uh, with a normal, um, in a normal patient. And this is a nodule on a bit of bowel. And this is what happens as we proceed with the surgery itself to try and clear away the disease. Staging of endometriosis, very nice for us to have staging, but unfortunately does not correlate with symptoms of severity. But what it does is that it allows clinicians to communicate with each other about what disease the patient has. Treatment, so treatment options, I've kind of categorized them into sort of self-management, pharmaceutical management, which has been covered by the last two speakers in terms of suppressing hormones. And really, what I really want to talk about a little bit more is surgery. There are pros and cons with each of them. And even though I've sort of listed them as three different categories, they can work together. And I think that every single patient with endometriosis will have benefit from this although not everyone will have benefit from this. And the other thing about endometriosis is that because not everyone have the same desires and diseases, it's very important to tailor the treatment according to what the patient wants. If it is fertility that they want, you might want to do something over the other. It is all about what the patient wants and all about imp improving their quality of life. This is a little um, simple sort of flow chart to talk about, uh, to summarize treatment options. In general, if disease is mild to moderate, maybe simple measures like anti-inflammatories or oral contraceptive pill might be enough. If it's more severe because of pain, then I think laparoscopy is probably better. And it's been shown to improve symptoms afterwards. But obviously, the problem is that afterwards, it is important to then get onto some sort of hormonal treatment to suppress cycles so that it doesn't recur. Otherwise, recurrence is actually very common. If patients have infertility, then there will be special consultations. But these are the patients that I think will benefit from surgery as well. Medical treatment options, I don't want to talk too much about that, but it does depend on where you block your hormones. If you block it, the higher up you block, the more side effects you're going to have. Because if you block it at the brain level, it's not going to produce very much estrogen. Your bone will start to suffer. Your heart will start to suffer, just like a, like a menopause type state. Whereas if you block it sort of closer to the ovary level or the uterus level, then you tend to have slightly less side effects and it's better tolerated. Surgical treatment, unfortunately, is all or nothing. I like to tell my, what I don't want to tell my patients is that if we're going to do surgery, I think that the best thing to do is that if you're already having that risk of the operation, go for it. We'll have to remove everything and look at how we can suppress the cycles afterwards to, um, to reduce recurrence. It is a multidisciplinary approach in that we often have gynecologists working together with colorectal surgeons, with uh, urologists. The aim is to remove all of the disease. Just a little bit about what we actually do in terms of bowel-related type disease. Photo, this is a diagram of the bowel. So this is the sigmoid colon, one of the very commonly affected sites. Imagine a little deposit like that. If it's a very small nodule, if it's very superficial, because it's not involving the, the, throughout the layer of the bowel, all we can, what we need to do is a little shave. We just thin up the bowel a little bit. If it's a little bit more advanced, a bigger nodule, and a little bit deeper, what we often have to do is actually do what we call a disc. In these patients, we don't have to remove the back wall or the side, just the site where it is affected. This is what we call a disc resection using a stapler. And the end result is basically that. That one. 
where you have a little stitch line, but the rest of the bowel is completely left intact because it preserves the nerves, it allows the patient to have better bowel function afterwards. And finally, if you've got even more extensive disease or multiple spots on the bowel, then you do have to re have a bit of bowel removed in what we call a resection. Obviously, the risk associated with this is a little bit higher. And this is how we do the joint if we do have to remove the a little bit of bowel. Infertility often related to adhesions or inf inflammation, abnormal hormonal environment. And uh, what we have found in RPA in our experience is that in patients where infertility is a key, removing the adhesion certainly improves fertility. Recurrence is a problem simply because if you don't suppress those cycles, it is likely to come back even if you remove all the disease at the time of surgery. What about the risk of cancer? There has been reports that there is a slight increased risk in association with ovarian cancer. It is small. Uh, it also depends on whether or not you're Western or whether you're Asian um, in terms of treatment because of the, whether or not the, the endometriomas themselves have estrogen or progesterone receptors. The cause of it is probably related to iron irritation and surgery can reduce the risk of certain cancers, but in general, the risk reduction is small but not entirely clear. There is a need for patient-centered care because symptoms are very different from, from patient to patient and also because it is a chronic disease, there is a high risk of recurrence and treatment can still be associated with the residual symptoms. And treatment can have significant adverse effects and patients will have different um, will place different significance on symptoms, fertility, and cancer risk. So in conclusion, I'm very sorry I ran over time, endometriosis is common. It can be difficult to diagnose because of the broad symptomatology and overlapping and possible differential diagnosis. Treatment can have significant side effects and needs to be tailored to the individual um, based on symptom severity, desire to have children, and concerns for malignancy. And quality of life ultimately is the key and patient-centered care is important. Thank you.